Hi, in this video, we're going to talk about curvature. So the notion of curvature is uh, it's pretty simple, really. Consider a track with many turns and bends, like this diagram that I made up here. The curvature of the track measures how tight the curve is, how fast it's turning. The tighter the curve, the greater the curvature. So if we look at some points here on the curve, point S is in the middle of a very tight bend, whereas point R, you've got this really wide, slowly turning curve. So the curvature at S is much greater than at R. P is somewhere between the curvature of S and R. And then if you're on a straight, so going in a straight line, you'd say that the curvature there is zero. So curvature is never negative. It doesn't matter whether you're making a turn to the left or to the right, that, that isn't part of curvature. Uh, it's just a matter of how tight the curve is. So before we can come up with a, a formal definition of curvature, we have to be a little bit careful. And so we have to say that we need a smooth parameterization. So what does smooth mean? Well, it's going to be smooth on an interval r if the derivative r prime of t is continuous and r prime of t is never zero. And we saw that condition before about r prime never being the zero vector. Uh, we need that to be able to say that we have a tangent vector and to be able to define a unit tangent vector for each value of t. And so then we'll call a curve smooth if it has a smooth parameterization. So on a smooth curve, the rate of change of the unit tangent vector measures the curvature. So let's think about that rate of change. So it is a unit tangent vector. Its length is not changing. It's only the direction. So it's the rate of change of the direction of the unit tangent vector, which measures the curvature. You could almost think of it as a rotational change. So the curvature then is the magnitude of the derivative of the unit tangent vector with respect to s, which Remember, that's our arc length. The letter that we use for curvature is the Greek letter kappa. So let's see how this, make, this definition agrees with our idea of having a tight curve. So if I go a distance, an arc length, so along the curve of delta s, here my unit tangent vector as pointing about in that direction. And then I've made a change in direction when I get a, go over to s plus delta s. If I compare that when I'm on a very tight curve here, go the same length along the arc delta s, you can see there's a significantly greater change in direction. So how can we calculate curvature? Because taking the derivative with respect to arc length, unless we already have a parameterization with respect to arc length, can be very challenging. But the chain rule can help us out. Uh, if I just apply the chain rule here, I can think of dt ds as being dt, so the derivative with respect to the capital T, over the derivative with respect to some parameter. And then I look at the rate of change of my parameter with respect to arc length. Well, this is why we use the Leibniz notation. These are not fractions, but we can work with them as if they were fractions. And we get this following relationship then, that if I take the derivative of my tangent vector with respect to my parameter, whatever parameter I have, and divide it by the derivative of arc length with respect to the parameter, I'll get the derivative with respect to the arc length. 
Well, how does that help us? Well, remember the arc length function. We divided, I'm sorry, we defined it using this integral and then used the fundamental theorem of calculus to say, oh, its derivative is just the magnitude of the derivative of the tangent vector evaluated at t. And so now if I take the magnitude of this expression, I'll find that the curvature will just be the magnitude of t prime over the magnitude of r prime. So again, note that curvature is a scalar and curvature can be zero. Remember in a straight line, but it's never negative. All right, let's look at an example. This a very important idea that the curvature of a circle which has a radius of a is one over a. So here I have a circle and the natural way to parameterize a circle whose radius is a is we'll use x equals a cosine t, y equals a sine t. So to use our formula then I need to calculate first r prime. I'll need the magnitude of r prime. But since I have sine squared t plus cosine squared t, I know that is going to equal 1. I'll be left with radical a squared, which is just a. Now I have to find my unit tangent vector. So I'll take r prime of t and divide it by its length. And so I'm just dividing r prime of t by a, so the a's divide out. I'm just left with negative sine of t cosine of t. Pretty simple expression. I can take its derivative directly. I'll get negative cosine of t, negative sine of t, and the length of that vector is 1. It's just square root of cosine squared plus sine squared, which is going to be the square root of 1, which is just 1. So my curvature then will be the length of t prime over the length of r prime, which is indeed 1 over a. Well, let's try to find curvature using our formula for another vector. Uh, here, this is a curve in 3 space. And um, pretty simple component functions, just t, t squared, and e to the t. So simple uh, r prime. Not so simple for its magnitude, though. I get this radical expression, 1 plus 4t squared plus 2t. I mean, e to the 2t. Huh. Which means that my unit tangent vector as a function of t is my original r prime divided by that radical expression. And OK, I'm going to have to take that the derivative of that. So I'm going to go ahead and write this as a product. I'm going to have a vector function here. This is a scalar function. And I know I can use the product rule with that. So let's see where that takes me. So I'll take the derivative of the first, which is my function, right? function vector function. I'll multiply that times the second, no derivative. And I'll add to that, well, I just have the first with no derivative, times the derivative of the second. So first I'll need to use the power rule. Then I need to take the derivative of the inside. I'm applying the chain rule. That's how I get my 8t and 2e to the power of t. So that's just t prime of t. Then I would need to find the magnitude of t prime of t, and then take the magnitude of r prime of t and divide it by that. And I'm just going to say, yikes. Even for a relatively simple curve, or a curve with a simple parameterization, uh, this is getting very, very complicated very quickly. <laughs> 
So there's got to be a better way. And so let's look at this a little bit more carefully. And there's going to be a lot of vector algebra here. So we're going to uh, connect this back to some of the concepts we have learned in chapter 12 when we first started learning about vectors. So it's good to make these connections. So what are we looking for? We want a formula for the curvature as a function of t, which just includes simple computations, like calculating r prime, r double prime. Uh, those are, are, are generally very simple computations. And we'd like to avoid complicated derivatives. So there's a trade-off here. In order to have simple computations, we can't have just a simple formula for curvature. The curvature formula is going to look more complicated, but the computations will be simpler. All right, so let's just start with the formula or the definition of our unit tangent vector. We'll take our tangent vector, divide it by its length. And when I'm working here, everything is a function of t, but to simplify what I'm writing down, I'm just going to write the, the letters without the parentheses t. So again, I'm going to write this as a product. I'm going to have the vector r prime times the reciprocal of the length of r prime. Well, what was the, what was the length of r prime? Remember that the length of any vector is the radical of the vector dotted with itself. So the length of r prime is the square root of r prime dotted with r prime. But that was in the denominator, so I bring it up to make a product here uh, with a negative one half exponent. So now let me try using the product rule again. Take the derivative of the first, so the derivative of r prime would be r double prime times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. So when I'm taking the derivative here, this is a scalar function, by the way. So I'm going to use the power rule, so I'll have negative one half, still same dot product on the inside. Now the new exponent, I'd have to subtract 1, that's how I get negative 3 halves, times the derivative of the inside. And so again, what's the derivative of the inside? Well, if I take r prime and dot it with itself, take its derivative, what am I going to get? Well, I can use the product rule with the, with the dot product. So I'd get the derivative of the first, which would be r double prime, dotted with the second, which is r prime, plus the first, which is just r prime, dotted with the second, well, the, der the derivative of the second, which would be r double prime. And since the order of dot product doesn't matter, that means I'll get two r prime dotted with r double prime. All right, so we still have a pretty complicated expression here, but bear with me. Let's do a little algebra here. First of all, we can simplify the negative one half is going to divide into two to make one. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite. Now I have still have the negative, so I'm going to change that plus to a minus not doing anything here yet, but I'm going to break up this negative three halves. So what I've done is I've said that r prime dotted with itself raised to the negative three halves is r prime 
had it with itself raised to the negative one half, and then r prime dotted with r prime to the negative one power. So the negative one power means I can bring it down into the denominator, and I still have this r prime dotted with r double prime, so I'll just put that together as a fraction. Of course, I still have uh, the r prime vector out in front. And now, why did I do that? Because then I can see I have a common factor of r prime dotted with r prime raised to the negative one-half power. And there's another reason I wanted to rewrite it that way. After I factor that out, this expression that we see inside the brackets should look familiar to us from when we were studying vector algebra. We've seen something like this before. So let's take a little bit of review here. When we talked about the components of a vector, you could break down a vector A into two components. One component, which was in the same direction as another vector B, and another component, which was orthogonal to the vector B. And the expression that we got for that was this expression right here. This, all we did is we took the vector A and subtract it off the component of A, the vector component of A, in the direction of B, or it's also called the projection of A onto the vector B. And look at what we have here. I have a vector minus the vector dotted with a different vector over the dot product of that different vector times that different vector. That's exactly what our expression is right here. So what this is, is the vector component of r double prime, which is orthogonal to r prime. In other words, and this vector <coughs> is saying that, oh, we're only taking the part of r double prime, which is orthogonal to r prime. We're multiplying it by another scale factor here, a scalar out in front. But that's not going to change its direction. It's still going to be the part of r double prime, which is perpendicular to r prime. So t prime must be perpendicular or orthogonal to r prime. And we've seen that before, too. That should make sense to us, because when we talked about uh, properties of a, a vector, we said that if the magnitude of a vector was constant for all values of t, so the magnitude of this vector function, then the dot product of the uh, vector with its derivative would be 0 for all t. And so we made a note down here that, well, one vector that we know that satisfies this is our unit tangent vector. Our unit tangent vector, by definition, has length 1 for all t. So if I take the derivative of t and dot it with t, I should get 0. Well, the uh, t, if you remember, is just r prime dotted with, I mean, r prime divided by its length. And so if t prime is orthogonal to r prime, of course, t prime is orthogonal to t, and vice versa. So it's good to make those connections. So let me take my same diagram, but now let me change from a and b to the vectors that we're using. So I've got a vector r double prime, and we know that the uh, derivative of the unit tangent vector is parallel to this 
orthogonal component to the component of r double prime orthogonal to r prime. And then down here, the green vector now is the projection of r double prime onto r prime or the component of r double prime, which is in the same direction as r prime. All right, so I'm just going to make a slight change in what I wrote before. Instead of having 1 over the square root of r prime dotted with itself, we'll just change that back to the length of r prime. And this is a right triangle. If I look at the lengths of each one of these sides, they should obey the Pythagorean theorem. So remember, I'm trying to calculate the length of t prime. So if I can calculate the length of what's inside the vector, I only need to multiply it by this scalar out in front. So let's try to calculate this component of r double prime in the direction of r prime, this orth component. Well, I'll start with the Pythagorean theorem. And I'll say, oh, let me just subtract off then. So the length of the orth squared would be the length of r double prime squared minus the length of the projection squared. And remember, the projection is this portion right here. So to take its length, I would have to square the scalar that's out in front and then multiply that times the square of the length of r prime. All right, but what's in the bottom here is r prime, the length of r prime squared, and then I'd square that again. So it'd be r prime to the fourth. So I would have the length of r prime to the fourth times the, in the bottom, the length of r prime squared multiplied by it. So those will divide out. Now I'll be left with just the length of r prime squared and the dot product of uh, r double prime with r prime squared. All right, so that was a nice simplification. I've got a simpler uh, expression here. And I'm going to make a, a further simplification. Uh, I already have this factor here of 1 over the length of r. And so I'm going to factor out 1, 1 over the length of r prime squared. So there's no fraction in here. But to do that, I have to multiply in a factor of r prime squared here. So just think about that for a minute. Verify that this gets the right thing. If I multiply this times the first, t first term, the length of r prime squared divides out, and I'd be left with the length of r double prime. And if I multiply 1 over r prime squared times the second squared, I get this fraction here. So that gives me uh, an expression for this orth vector, what's inside the brackets up here after I take the square root of both sides. So the square root, I'll only have now uh, 1 over r prime. Then I'll have this big radical expression. But what's inside the radical expression is not really that bad compared to what we were looking at in our original formula. Yes, this is a complicated formula, and it's only the formula for the orth part. If I want to get to the length of t prime, I have to multiply the length of the orth by 1 over r prime, which means this 1 over r prime will get multiplied by the second 1 over r prime, and I'll have 1 over r prime squared times this radical expression. Now, it, it is a more complicated formula, but it should be easier to work with in terms of our computations. So here's our new formula for t prime, which means that in order to get to our curvature, I have to take the length of t prime and divide it by r prime. 
Well, that's the same as multiplying by yet another factor of one over the length of r prime. So I'll have one over the length of r prime cubed times this radical expression. So this should be better. It's a complicated formula, but the computations should be simpler. So let's go back. Here was our original curve. We can take its first derivative. We also need its second derivative. We'll need, in this formula, their dot product, which is not a difficult computation. I'll need the length of r prime. So remember, that's uh, actually, I need the length of r prime squared for this formula uh, and the length of r double prime squared. That's just the vector dotted with itself. So, so far, these are, are fairly simple. The only derivatives I needed to take were over here, and those were very simple derivatives. And I guess the uh, most algebra we need to do is to calculate the product of these two, the product of r prime squared times r double prime squared. So that's polynomial multiplication. And so I'll get these six terms here. I'm sure I got one, two, three, four, five six times there. Then I need to subtract. Oh, I'm sorry. What else? Uh, oh, I also need to square this dot product. So let me go ahead and square that. I'll use FOIL to square that. And I'll get the three terms. 16t uh, squared. And then the middle term should be twice the product. So 8t e to the 2t. And then the square of the last term be e to the 4t. All right, so now under the radical, I need to subtract those two expressions. So let me do that using this vertical format so I can write the like terms under each other. Uh, so we have two like terms, and they actually subtract out. I have 16t squared uh, from here, and then a 16t squared here. So that's going to uh, subtract to make 0. I also have this e to the 4t. So they'll subtract out. But these remaining terms, will, so I'll still have a 4, a 5e to the 2t, a minus 8t e to the 2t, and a plus 4t squared e to the 2t. That is what goes under the radical expression. And then the length of r cubed, well, I would just take square roots of this and then cube it. And so on top, I have the radical of this expression. And there's no further simplification possible here. And then on the bottom, I'll have the radical of this expression raised to the power of 3. So that's the same as 3 halves. So complicated formula but relatively simple expressions or simple computations. And so that is better. But I think we can do even better by doing a little bit more vector algebra. If I look at what's in the radical here or what's under the radical sign, I could, bear with me, I could factor out well, let me put it this way, multiply and divide by the first term here. So in other words, I'm going to divide both of these terms by the length of r double prime squared times the length of r prime squared. But if I divide by them, then I'll have to multiply here on the outside. Or you could also think of it as factoring this out. But then what I'll have is this dot product squared over the length of r double prime squared times the length of r prime squared, which I can just write as one fraction squared. But this should look familiar, this fraction right here, the dot product of one vector with another divided by their lengths. That is the cosine of the angle between the two vectors. So if I call that angle theta, for example, then inside the brackets, I have 1 minus cosine squared theta. But 
from our Pythagorean identity, which says sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals 1, 1 minus cosine squared theta is just sine squared theta. So this is what's under the radical, so let's go ahead and take the radical of that. Everything is squared, so now I'm just going to get the length of r double prime times the length of r prime times sine theta. And we've seen that formula before as well. That is the length of the cross product. So this part here, which is clearly the most, ex most complicated part of our formula, can be simplified down to just the length of the cross product of r double prime by r prime. So now we have, not only is this a simple formula, but it involves simple computations. So what if we take our, our new formula and go back to our original example? So here, I only need to find the length of r prime. I don't need to find the length of r double prime. I don't need to square those things, although squaring them is no work. It's actually more work to, to, to uh, and I need to add an important thing here. This is, I need the one half power for the length of r prime. Uh, but I don't need the dot product. I don't need to square that dot product. Really, all I need to do is uh, find the length of the cross product. So, if I want to find the, the cross product, I'll go ahead and use my determinant uh, formula here. So I put my i, j, k vectors across in the first row. This is r double prime, the components for r double prime, the components for r prime. And then let's calculate the uh, components of the cross vector. So I'd have 2 times e to the t minus 2t e to the t. Then for j, well, I have 0. And then here, I would get minus e to the t. But remember, with j, you have to put a minus sign out in front. So that gives me a positive e to the t. And then for k, I'll have 0 and then minus 2. I have to fix that. OK. So the length of the cross product, then, I would just need to take the square root of the sum of the squares of the components. So with the first component, with the i component, I'm going to have to use FOIL. But otherwise, um, the other two components are, are relatively simple. And after I collect the like terms, you're going to see that I have the exact same terms that I got using the other formula, which is good. It should be. They should be equivalent. And so now my uh, curvature then, I'd have the same radical expression on top and then the same expression raised to the 3 halves power in the denominator. So if we have a special case, we have a, a plane curve where we can express, express y as a function of x, let's see what our formula would give you. Uh, if you recall, when you have y as a function of x, you can actually use x as your parameter. So you would say x equals x, y has a formula, f of x, and then it, we're going to embed this in three space, we're just going to say, well, the z component is always going to be zero. Uh, 
So my first derivative and second derivative. Well, first, if I want to find the first derivative, I just get 1. It's derivative with respect to our parameter, which is x. So I'll get 1, f prime of x, and 0. The length of that would be the square root of the sum of the squares, so the length of r prime. The second derivative, well, it will just be 0 and f double prime of x, and then 0. So calculating the cross product is pretty simple because of uh, the, the in, only have one component, which is non-zero and r double prime. That winds up being what? Uh, that's a mistake on my part. I apologize. There's only one component, but it is still going to be a vector. So uh, the uh, ith component is 0. So I'm going to get things in the right place here. So the ith component is 0. The jth component is also 0. Head over a little bit more. And the kth component has f double prime. And if you think about that, that makes sense. That if both r prime and r double prime are in the xy plane, because we have a curve that's in the xy plane, then their cross product has to be orthogonal to the xy plane, which means it's parallel to the z axis. And so the uh, length then of r double prime times r prime is just the absolute value of f double prime of x. So uh, I'll just write this as being f double prime times the k hat vector. And so now we've got a very uh, simple formula. The magnitude of uh, r double prime cross r prime is just the absolute value of f prime f double prime of x. And then a little bit more complicated for the denominator, the length of r prime is 1 plus uh, f prime of x squared, kind of reminds us of arc length, the arc length expression with the square root there, and then we cube it, raise it to the power of 3. So let's find the curvature then of this uh, cubic polynomial using this formula. So first derivative, just 3x squared minus 4. Second derivative, 6x. So very simple derivative computations using this formula. And so this is the expression for the curvature. It's the absolute value of 6x. So we need absolute values down here. Here we have the square root of sum of squares. So this, I don't need absolute values in the denominator because when I square something, add it to another square, that's positive. I take a positive number and raise it to any exponent, it's still going to be positive. So to finish up, uh, well, I can multiply this out or I could have left it in that, in that form. Uh, I went ahead and graphed the original curve, so our cubic polynomial. And then I looked at the curvature. And uh, a couple of things uh, of interest here. Nobody's surprised that outside of this, these two arches right here, the curvature is very tiny. So this portion in the middle is essentially straight, very little curvature there. And then once you get out to these branches, they're still moving to the left. There still is some curvature. It's not zero. They're not straight lines, but they are essentially straight lines. So the greatest curvature 
occurs when we make this turning point, but not at the local min or the local max. The uh, It's just a little bit, be, uh, if we look at it this way, just a little bit before I reach the local max, that's where the greatest curvature is. Now, this is an odd function, so uh, when, I, when I'm on the right side, again, it's right before I reach the local min, that's where I have the greatest curvature. All right, so I thought this was a really nice topic. It tied together um, something new, our notion of curvature, with a lot of our previous analysis, including a lot of topics from vector algebra. Um, we'll make a follow-up video where we're going to talk about a, a unit normal vector, a unit binormal vector, and three important planes determined by those vectors.